Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, Designing Inclusive Training Programs in Energy Efficiency. My name is Jane Cohen. I'm a Senior Program Manager here at the IEA, and I lead our work on people-centered clean energy transitions. I'm really excited about this panel, um, and uh, we'll jump into it in, in just a minute. Um, but first, I wanted to um, hear a few words from Brian Motherway, who's the uh, Director of our Office of uh, Energy Efficiency and Inclusive Transitions. Thank you, Jane. Uh, let me add my warm welcome to everybody. It's a pleasure to have you joining us today. Uh, we're delighted to see so many of you online and some really excellent speakers that I know you're going to enjoy hearing from. On what is really a very important topic, I think some of you who, who follow the work of the IA will know that we've been putting increasing focus on issues around social impacts, the labor and jobs dimension, how people are affected by clean energy transitions and how can we ensure the maximum benefits, not just overall, but also for the people who need them the most and therefore who benefits, who pays and how can policies and other interventions make sure that, that we get that right to make sure that that transitions deliver what they're supposed to do, which is to uh, make people's lives better, but also to make sure they are fair and seen to be fair. And of course, jobs is a key element of that. We know from our analysis that clean energy transitions will create literally millions more jobs than will be lost in the transition. But of course, uh, there's no point in just talking about global figures. We have to think about where are those jobs, uh, who will get them, who is at risk of losing their jobs, how are workers and communities negatively affected going to be supported. And many governments and other actors are working on these issues right now, including some of our speakers today. A key dimension of this is skills, because we know already that in some areas of clean energy, including some of the ones we're going to talk about in this webinar, there are actually shortages in many countries of the right skilled labor to fill the posts that are becoming available due to a stronger focus, in this case, on energy efficiency. And we see mismatches where certain communities may be at risk of losing jobs in certain sectors. And are those people working in those jobs ready to avail of the new opportunities, ready to move into new career paths that, that have decent employment opportunities for them. All of this gives a key role to government to get it right, starting now in terms of, of programs for skills, planning ahead in terms of workforce development, and making sure that existing and future workforces are ready for the positive opportunities that clean energy transitions uh, will create. And also in this period of change and growth in jobs in these sectors, there's an opportunity not just to skill people up in a, in a simple way, but to address wider questions such as inclusivity, uh, who gets these jobs, how do marginalized communities benefit from these jobs, how do we deal with issues of informality uh, in various sectors, which is certainly an issue that, that could do with a focus. And in a period of change and growth, it's an opportunity to give us that focus. Today, we're looking at energy efficiency. I think it's an area that maybe doesn't get as, as much attention when people think about clean energy jobs. They maybe picture renewables and, and electricity systems and that. But in many ways, uh, energy efficiency not only has greater numbers of jobs than some of those other sectors, but also greater diversity in terms of the type of work, where it happens, the type of people who can avail of that work. And therefore, it's a key opportunity, as well as the fact that energy efficiency interventions often have very immediate and tangible benefits in people's lives. People uh, become warmer in their homes or cooler in their homes. People have more access to mobility. Uh, businesses become more competitive. Jobs are protected or created. So energy efficiency is a key issue that we think does need more attention. In some ways, it's harder to measure what an energy efficiency job looks like and therefore what skills go with it. But again, that's something uh, we will talk about today. And we will also talk about in a new report that we're releasing in just a couple of weeks time, because both our analysis and today's event are part of a very positive collaboration that we have between the IEA and the Clean Energy Ministerial Empowering People Initiative uh, that's focusing on skills for clean energy transitions. In that regard, I want to thank our colleagues in the Clean Energy Ministerial and particularly the lead governments behind in the Empowering People Initiative, uh, the US Department of Energy, Natural Resources Canada, and the European Commission Directorate for uh, General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion. We thank you for your support and your ongoing engagement. And we welcome everybody joining us today to be aware that these topics are of interest to us and the governments we work for and work with. So we'd love to hear from you during the seminar 
are. Uh, we'd also love to hear you in follow up. Do please get in touch if you have points of view, if you have data or interesting examples to share with us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Do please get in touch. So I'm looking forward to hearing from all of our panelists today. And Jane, back to you to get things rolling. Thank you, Brian. Um, so as Brian said, skills and, and labor and workforce are a really important part of the transition. As we know, we talk about that a lot here at the IEA. Um, but there's also a difference between sort of making policy um, at any level and then how it's actually implemented and where you know the rubber meets the road in terms of really reaching people, ensuring that the training, um, that not in addition to the training, that sort of all the other pieces are there so that people can succeed. Um, and so I'm really happy to have this group of, of four panelists with us today who are all working really on, on the implementation piece of this in different ways. Um, and um, so I would say really are sort of on the policy and practitioner uh, side of things to help us understand really sort of what are the realities um, and what are the differences in different places in terms of, you know, how to reach populations, how to make sure that training um, really aligns with what people need. Uh, what are, um, you know, what should we be thinking about in addition to just kind of technical training in terms of supporting people as they are entering, uh, entering the workforce? course. Um, and, um, you know, we, we are really focused on this kind of idea of an inclusive workforce. And so how do we actually make that a, a reality? So really happy to have this group of panelists today. Um, so just quickly introducing our, our panels. So we have Corey uh, Coate from the Indigenous uh, Clean Energy uh, in Canada. We have Mugari Najendu from Global Buildings Performance Network. We have Andre Tom, uh, Thomas from Isles Inc. And we have um, uh, Simon Schmidt from Skill Labs. And just to, to kind of put it out there, we're really pretty globally represented here today between Canada, the US, uh, Africa, the EU. You know, we are missing a couple of regions there, but we're, I think we're covering a, a pretty good swath. Um, but to those of you out there who are, um, who are from other places, we really wanna hear from you as well. So please do not uh, hesitate to, to reach out. So I'm gonna start with you, uh, Corey. Um, so I'd love for you to really introduce Indigenous Clean Energy to us and tell us what that organization does. Um, and then I'm thinking specifically about uh, energy efficiency, if you could talk about the Bringing It Home initiative, um, but really address for us, what are the barriers for kind of bringing Indigenous communities into the clean energy sector and into energy efficiency? And what are you seeing as some kind of successes? Like, tell us about your experience in this area. Definitely, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and I'm uh, happy to be here. Um, yes, um, my, first I'd like to introduce myself where I'm from. So my name is Corey Cote. I'm from Kitagon Zibi Anishinaabeg, which is in Quebec in Canada, about an hour and a half, two hours north of Ottawa, the capital of Canada, of course. Um, so coming from a nation, uh, that really motivated me to, to do a lot of this work. And so it brought, brought me to ICE. Uh, so Indigenous clean energy uh, re is really where I found my footing in the clean energy sector. Um, we're a, no a national not-for-profit that advances Indigenous-led capacity building and collective action in Canada's clean energy transition. Um, so we, 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 our work really revolves around advancing that, that sustainable prosperity uh, by supporting First Nation, Métis, and Inuit clean energy participation and, and in every region of Canada. So we are, we are national um, and we work with all the three main Indigenous groups in, in the country. Um, we have a range of programs that spans from everything from the, we have a catalyst program that talks about the uh, energy spectrum at, at more broadly, like we'll go into transmission generation. Uh, we have two youth programs. One of them does focus specifically on clean energy, uh, employment opportunities for indigenous youth 18 to 30 and, and getting them, uh, started in the uh, clean energy workforce. Uh, and then there's the Bringing It Home program, which focuses specifically on energy efficiency, and that's the, the program I'm the, the manager for. Um, and this program is an Indigenous-led initiative to enable and implement healthy, energy-efficient homes and facilities in, in, in First Nation, Métis, and Inuit communities all across Canada. 
Um, so everything that we do within Bringing It Home is really about uh, how do we scale up energy efficiency initiatives? How can we do community scale energy efficiency and replicate that in Indigenous communities across, across the country? Um, and we want to, we want these projects to be community based, but we also want them to be long term and, and really ingrain and embed these these new approaches to housing so that we're, we're seeing that long term change rather than one off projects. Um, so bringing it home in, in our early days, uh, we, our, our early program days, we started off by supporting a few indigenous communities who were working through some energy efficiency project work. Uh, this was happening slowly, and then you know, COVID happened. Everything sort of stopped. Um, so, to ensure that we're still progressing on 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 our work, we decided to get proactive, and to really scale up our efforts, uh, we did we had we decided to develop a national project accelerator program that will catalyze new community scale energy efficiency projects. Uh, so we've we've taken community input and learnings from our early program community work and and developed this this new project accelerator program, uh, and it's really meant to speed up the uptake of indigenous energy efficiency on on a national scale. Um, at its core, the the project accelerator is a capacity building program, and it's designed to support that project development uh, stage of of indigenous community scale energy efficiency housing projects. So we're focusing on, on housing first and, and foremost. Uh, that's where a lot of the support is needed in Indigenous communities in Canada. Um, there are a lot of issues stemming from poor housing conditions uh, that we're trying to address through, through the efficiency, and that's our approach to it. Um, and communities recognize the need for this work for us, the challenge and what we've heard, the feedback that we heard working with uh, and, and engaging with communities across the country is that there's a, a gap in support for them to be able to properly plan and implement a, an energy efficiency project at scale. Uh, we find that there's a lot of um, cultural um Cultural, it's like a sort of a cultural fit to, when we talk about energy efficiency because like it, and then being indigenous myself, like it's it's very much ingrained in us to uh, really take what only what you need and conservation is is really ingrained into our indigenous beliefs. Um, so I think there's a really interesting fit here, and there's a, a very uh, a very uh, the, the people that we're reaching are very motivated and and interested in, in this topic and taking it forward. And 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 you're right. Uh, it, energy efficiency is often overlooked, right? It's not, uh, it's not the, you know, the big sexy uh, wind turbine or solar panel uh, farm, you know, like it's, it's, it happens sort of, it's unseen, it's happening in the background. So it's, it's very easy to, to get overlooked by some of the other clean energy uh, topic uh, and sector uh, topics that we can kind of see. Um, so yeah, we're we're trying to sort of build up communities so that they're prepared to to take on these these projects. And and the overall goal of the program is to support the improvements, the efficiency. Uh, but there there are other co benefits that we're hoping to drive as well uh, by approaching the the housing with it. so things such as uh, health of the the community members, uh, you know, by improving the indoor air quality and the, uh, you know, preventing mold. Uh, we're talking about affordability of, of the homes. We're talking about availability. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's these sorts of impacts that really resonate with community members. And that's why there's such, a, such an, an interest in, in the topic. And we've seen uh, a lot of engagement from our end uh, when, when putting this program together. Um, and really the, the program is, is building this, capacity through collaboration, uh, through knowledge sharing and learning from one another uh, so that any community coming in to who wants to start an energy efficiency project is not starting from scratch. Uh, they'll, we're, we're building a network, we're building resources uh, to really sort of have that information available to them so they're not recreating the wheel. Uh, a lot of the, the the science, the building science, the energy, the energy science is all there. We're just kind of bringing that straight to the community so that they have the information they need to make informed decisions. Um, the program 
operates, uh, we offer a, a blend of virtual and in-person learning. Um, we offer program grants that will actually support their on the ground project development work. We offer mentorship and coaching, and this is really uh, to support their, their capacity and, and make sure that they have uh, full wraparound supports to actually enable success of, of these projects. Um, what was really cool about the program was that it was developed in partnership and worked with a lot of engagement from Indigenous leaders, champions, uh, people with on the ground experience, Indigenous housing organizations, and, and even non-Indigenous organizations to really uh, guide our curriculum to to build uh to build it to be as impactful as it can be uh really guided the direction of how we where we went as a program and then these same people these experts that we, this has been a big part of my job to to kind of go out there uh, canada is a vast country uh so i've been a big part of my job has connect been connecting with these people to bring them in to make sure that all of this knowledge that's spread out and previously in silos is brought together to deliver um to deliver impactful programming. Uh, so these people are actually the ones to deliver our content as well and, and actually connect directly and share their knowledge directly with the communities who are wanting to uptake uh, the, and use their knowledge and apply it to, uh, to a project. So yeah, that's uh, in a nutshell, hopefully that was a good explanation of Indigenous Clean Energy and our Bringing It Home program. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll leave it there and we can move on to the next uh, panelist though. Uh, thanks, Corey. Before before I let you go, <laughs> um, I want to just follow up because when you're talking about you know the knowledge sharing, et cetera, and it's all you know really interesting. Um, in terms of kind of training and training in communities, it's it's you know there's of course the knowledge sharing part, but there's also like the physical actual like implementation of energy efficiency um, uh, interventions. And so I'm wondering about that. Um, and sort of how you move from the, you know, the virtual training into, you know, who is actually, you know, doing the, the kind of labor force aspect of it. Um, and is that mostly people who are like in communities? Is that a core part of your program? And how does that aspect of it work? Yeah, so it is, it is a, a core part of the program in, in terms of that we, we want these programs or these projects to be community based as much as possible. Uh, we want to build the capacity so that these communities are able to lead these projects for themselves. Uh, Self-determination around, around housing and, and energy is, is definitely something that is, is a key point for, for a lot of communities in the country, and that's something they, they would like to, to build. So as much as possible, yes. Um, when we talk about the, the training like, and the project development support that we're offering, like at the end of the program, we want to see every one of these communities coming out with a comprehensive project plan for a large scale energy efficiency project. And in, in that, uh, we want to see them uh, include like their employment and training plans. Uh, it, it, there are, so it's communities in Canada, there, there are like, they're vastly different from coast to coast to coasts. Uh, there are large, more urban communities. There are remote Northern communities. So it does differ. Um, from community to community on, on just having the, the people in the community, the manpower, like the people that actually take training and do the work. Uh, some communities have it, some communities have the people that need the training, some communities don't. So it's it's really, we're trying to put, uh, to encourage uh, work that works for their community and their, their situation. So like as much as possible, we're building that internal capacity for them to do the work. Some situations they have to uh, contract uh, and create partnerships for, to get them started. But we, we wanna see that, that internal leadership uh, as much as possible. Thanks, Corey, really interesting. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to you, Magore. And, and you are the Africa Project Lead for Golden, uh, Global Buildings Performance Network, um, and you know you should you should tell us all about about uh, the network. But I mean, essentially, one of the core objectives is to work towards net zero buildings. And I, I'm curious to learn from you, 
and, and to Corey's point, you know, Africa, not a monolith, you know, circumstances change a lot from place to place. Um, but can you talk us through in the work that you're doing kind of how, what does this workforce, local workforce training look like? I think it's, um, obviously it's, it's going to kind of look a little bit different um, than I think then Corey just spoke about, but I'm curious if you could kind of walk us through what that looks like, what community engagement looks looks like and how you're sort of communicating to communities about, you know, what your work is and how to bring them in. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Jane, uh, for that introduction. Um, I'll speak a little bit about uh, GBPN. Um, as mentioned, um, I serve as the Africa Programs Lead for the Global Buildings Performance Network. And just to maybe put that in perspective in terms of the work that GBPN does, um, it was very interesting to listen to Corey because um, there's so much similarity. Uh, GBPN supports uh, public, private, and community sectors to really collaborate and develop um, climate action policies in the built environment. Um, we have active programs uh, in India, Indonesia, Africa, and China, and really focused um, in these areas because a number of these regions are estimated to grow their building stock. Uh, by about 80% in the next uh, few years up until 2030. So it's it's really critical in these regions to be addressing uh, decarbonization of buildings because of that gap where the building stock exists. Um, and then in addition, um, at least for the African continent, some of the other challenges include, uh, we only have about 10 countries who actually do have building codes, um, many who don't really address um, energy efficiency and about only five countries um, that have updated their building codes in, in the last 10 years. Um, so there's an opportunity there right there to sort of um, make clear interventions towards achieving healthy and uh, zero emissions buildings, which is, which are accessible to people uh, because we care about the uh, human health and being people centered in all the work that we do. Um, one of the key things um, around the work that we do is, is we partner with our peers. Uh, we create local networks, which is why what Corey was saying was resonating so much with me, um, that we actually engage local experts, uh, build coalitions in the various countries that we engage with to ensure that um, it's a bottom up approach, that whatever solutions are emerging are not solutions emerging from top down, but are really co um, community uh, driven. Um, additionally, we also like to um, uh, sort of um, uh, undertake work where there's already something existing and, and, and being pushed by the local community. So that we offer the support to, to um, solutions that have already been identified by the local communities. Uh, with regards to sort of around uh, buildings and, and energy efficiency, the areas that we look at are climate proof building codes. Um, I mentioned that a bit, uh, emissions rating and disclosure, materials um, labeling emissions um, in materials. And then of course, and most critical indoor environmental quality standards, and I think Corey also touched on this, and then the enabling environment, which comes to finance and fiscal policies. Um, our current work is, is really broad, but some of the programs I think that are quite uh, relevant are in Indonesia, we're supporting green building policies, um, looking at affordable housing road, roadmaps that implement green strategies. Uh, in India, we are also supporting the implementation of the Energy Conservation and Sustainable Buildings uh, Code. And most recently on the African continent, the government of Kenya has invited GBPN to Magori, if you can hear me, we're losing you a little bit. Again, with all these um, issues at the forefront, equity, I um, want to just uh, touch on um, a specific example. And, and as I'm touching on the specific example, I think it might also be dealt with uh, across the globe uh, regards to trainings that are, are, are sort of... Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, Jane, can you hear me? I think we can hear you better now. But we, I think we lost a little bit of, of what you said there. Okay. Um, so if you can go maybe or, a few minutes and, and 
Um, I we lost you when you were talking about Indonesia. Okay, great. Um, I think I was uh, detailing some programs that GBPN is undertaking, and I mentioned the work that we're doing in Indonesia, uh, supporting uh, Indonesia's green building policies and green and affordable housing roadmaps, um, and then also work in India to do with energy conservation and sustainable building codes. Uh, and most recently on the African continent, uh, we've been invited by the government of Kenya to prepare um, a green uh, a, a decarbonization roadmap for the built environment. And of course, as that work is being undertaken, one of the key issues is going to be uh, addressing equity and inclusion. Um, I do want to talk about the barriers because as we speak about barriers, um, I'm aware because this is a global discussion, um, the barriers differ everywhere. And in, on the African continent, as you mentioned, Jane, um, it's quite wide and we do have different challenges depending on the countries. Um, but I do think one of the biggest barriers, I think, with regards to uh, training opportunities uh, on the continent is sort of around the disconnect between um, the training material or the training, um, the training uh, skills that are being uh, taken to communities and what the actual needs are on the ground for those communities. Um, and typically that leads to sort of ill-suited uh, trainings. Um, and of course, those can be addressed in sort of numerous ways, including sort of co-creation of programs, uh, with communities, which would be very critical to do because the communities are the ones that understand clearly what, what their needs are. Um, and of course, um, as training programs are being developed, and, and, and I always like to speak to this, it's, it's always good to recognize and correct for, for biases in terms of how we're developing training programs. And then really, um, and, and on the African continent, this is also really important, uh, considering consider how learning methodologies work. Um, not all audiences learn the same way. Uh, communities learn differently. So that's a critical aspect uh, from my perspective. I do want to talk about a, a successful sort of inclusive training program that has happened um, in Kenya, just as an example of some work that's happening that's quite successful. Um, Built Her is a company that's a nonprofit social enterprise. Um, and I've sort of focused on the gender element only because um, in the built environment on in Africa, on the low side, 3% of women are involved in construction. On the high end, it's 11 to 12%. So there's a huge gap uh, there. We're talking about uh, 3 million jobs in terms of green jobs being needed by 2030. And we need to take on, on board that 50% of the African population is, is, is women. Um, so Bill has a nonprofit social enterprise based in Kenya, um, in Nairobi. Um, this enterprise actually focuses on women from informal settlements. So if you know the informal settlements, uh, Kibera, um, um, uh, Madare, such informal settlements where a lot of low income women face economic and employment barriers. Build has program actually develops uh, critical trades women program um, skills, including carpentry, furniture making. This program actually has some really great wins, which I'd like to touch on. It's trained about 700 women and 80% of these women have been placed in employment. Um, and increase their income by two to three percent, uh, two to three percent, three two to three times more than they used to earn. So, what made this effective? And I'll just touch on this briefly. Um, why this program was specifically quite effective is that um, the program worked with the community to identify the challenges and plan for them in advance. Additionally, um, this program doesn't run as a straight, you know, six month, nine month program. The program actually allows for learning breaks because it recognizes that it's dealing with women, with families, with commitments. So because of the learning breaks, it allows the women to be active in their roles in the families and communities and come back to learning and complete the training rather than just drop off in the middle of the training. Um, it also offers a component of wellness empowerment, ensuring that these women for, from the informal communities are seen as um, a holistic, holistically and addressing all the issues that they deal, they deal with. Um, they also offer continued uh, professional development um, and then ensuring accreditation, which means you're validating the training that you have given these uh, artisans in the construction industry. Um, lastly, collaborating uh, with private sector partners to ensure the hiring. And then um, it's a continuous learning process for that particular training program where sector partners and from the community at large, and that makes that a very successful program. So Jane, I think I'll stop there and hand back over to you. Thank you so much. And um, Obviously, you're working in a lot of places, but it's really good to hear just an example of something that's working well and why. And let me just ask you a quick question about that. 
on Build Her, that's the name that I heard you say. Am I saying that right? Build Her? Um, Correct. Is there, are you seeing that replicated in other, you know, you said, I think this is, this is an informal, in, informal settlements around Nairobi. Are you seeing that model replicated, you know, elsewhere in that region or in Kenya generally? So uh, what we are seeing is that while the model has not been re replicated, for example, into the rural areas, we are seeing that the the, the program has been scaling up. Uh, when it started off, um, there was a lot of resistance from the community, um, and some of it was really in the traditional sense, um, you know, uh, women in the construction industry and sort of push back from family dynamics in terms of, 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 of why are you being involved in the construction industry. However, over the years, because they have seen such an economic transformation in their homes and the communities of the women who have been involved in these programs and the uptake has, has scaled up. So whereas the a first cohort started off with about uh, 17 women who were uh, in that program, um, the last cohort was at about 150 women. So the the, the sort of buy-in and community um, involvement and, and community involvement has really helped uh, quite a bit with regards to the program. I think it's, I, I'm glad to sort of hear your answer to that because I do think back to this notion of how important it is to recognize local context. So you have the kind of universal pieces. And I think, you know, what you said early on that a lot of what Corey said resonated with you. And I think that's probably true kind of across the panelists. And yet, you know, the kind of traditional gender roles, the, you know, pushback in the family, like those kinds of things that may be more local, more unique to a certain circumstance. It's just helpful, I think, to remember that we have to think about all of these pieces. Um, because if we don't, you know, something that is really a, a local concern can prevent the program or it has to be, you know, really kind of thought through. Um, so then speaking of local, so turning to more local, we've had, you know, we've had the national context with ICE. We've had um, looking at Africa and, and kind of other key places with Magori. Now, Andre, Andre, you're the director of training and support at IELTS Center for Energy and Environmental Training in Trenton, New Jersey. So now we're going really, really local here. Mm -hmm. um, you have been working with um, the local population in Trenton for quite a long time on on really energy efficiency, um, energy efficiency initiatives. And um, I'd really love to hear from you. First, you can, you know, introduce aisles and, and seat, but mm -hmm. I'd love to hear from you. Like, what does this really look like on the ground for you as a sure. trainer, as you're trying to um, recruit people into this program sure. and people who may not be, you know, in the formal workforce um, at the outset? What, how that training works in terms of, you know, how are you keeping people in the training programs? Sure. What, when you, how are you kind of thinking through job placement, what that actually actually looks like. I'd love for you just to kind of really take us through this um, mm -hmm. from a practitioner perspective. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me and thank you to the other speakers. I learned a lot from you, Corey and Maguri. That was that was awesome. And I'm excited because I see that we're doing some good things as well. Um, and it's good to see this is happening all over the globe. So this is awesome. Um, but I, as our mission is fostering self-reliant families and healthy, sustainable communities, and we do it through various ways. Um, I, I am on the training end where I provide um, lead training for contractors as well as um, energy efficiency training um, where they become BPI certified. BPI is the Building Performance Institute. They're the certifying body for the country. So it's a requirement to get those certifications in order to participate. Um, and so we do it in various ways. So IELTS is, we have various departments that handle these issues on the ground. So I'm gonna talk about um, our energy and environmental health services that actually provide weatherization for um, low income and also um, uh, healthy homes and lead remediation for low income. And why that is important, it, it offers opportunities for us to engage contractors that do the shell work and also the HVAC installs. And also, um, it also allows us to engage the contractors, some are local um, contractors to actually do the work to make the home healthy so that we can do the energy efficiency measures in, in that order. Uh, because our housing stock is in decay. In order for us to make it energy efficient, we have to first make it healthy, lead safe, 
and all of those things. And then that makes way for the energy efficiency work to go in. Um, we also have a um, IO street team that are on the ground helping us to um, to uh, re to do outreach to let folks know. So they're on the ground um, and we often rely on them to get to work on the street so that folks are aware of the programs that we offer. We also have Go Trenton, which is a um, newly formed department that actually provides electric vehicles and folks are able to mobilize throughout the city and beyond um, to get to jobs and, and, and appointments and, and those of that nature. Um, we also have a climate core department who, um, who works on various projects in the community um, and and the policy department, which is, you know, um, Jane is very familiar with that department. They really, um, you know, uh, keep us informed on the various policies. They influence uh, uh, government agencies to understand what's going on so that vulnerable communities are counted and, and we have services to help them. Why that is important, and I must uh, say Governor Murphy and their administration has been great with providing the resources so that we can do this work on the ground. And the reason why I say that, um, because we've, um, in the last couple of years, we have partnered with statewide, uh, we have a statewide lead network, and not just lead, because they actually do weatherization and lead as well, but they're pretty much agencies that do what we do here at IOMS. But we kind of join forces so that we can address uh, childhood lead poisoning and also impact New Jersey's carbon footprint. So we partner with agencies that do similar things that we do. They do the healthy homes approach and then they um, make the home energy efficiency. And what that does is it brings structure to this to this um, to this uh, to these efforts. Um, and, and so these agencies also they, they um, engage contractors to do the work and they also engage uh, uh, shell work that, that needs to be done to the home. So they kind of do what we do. And they all come through our particular training so that we can give get them the, pro the proper certification to do this work. And why that is important, because again, it also um, helps us to, to uh, do our workforce development e efforts because the contractors that are getting the work um, on various in the various areas, they need a workforce. So we've developed a workforce development arm that focuses on the barriers to employment. We want to engage unemployed, underemployed, and also returning citizens, folks that are coming out of the system, because we want to address recidivism. If we're not engaging these guys and they go back to what they know, and we want to show them that this is a viable path, they get an opportunity to own, not only uh, get employment, but also um do work that's important to their communities, help rebuild their communities. Um, so we found over the years is we've learned, we learned that um, in order to engage this workforce, um, the unemployed, underemployed, and returning citizens, and also incumbent workers, guys that are already working in the field, um, can also be engaged in this level. But why it is important, because we understand that in order for them to be engaged, we have to look at where they are, come where they are. And, and um, the first lady, the governor of the governor's office, uh, Tammy Murphy, was instrumental at uh, uh, helping us get a bridge grant that actually gives us the resources and the capability to remove significant barriers, to driver's license, just support so these guys can take care of those things and jump into the workforce. Um, and we also, we do soft skills training because that's important. It helps us to really get to know these guys, come where they are, develop them and 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 push them in these industries. Um, but, and also what we learned over the years in order to do this, because um, when you have workforce development, it's one thing to, to engage these guys to get them trained up, get them ready, remove these barriers. But another important piece that we are paying attention to is working with the employers, working with the employers, having them at the table, um, uh, letting us know what their needs are so that we can kind of begin with the end in mind and then develop the workers so that we can plug them into these opportunities. And the good part about it is because we have these efforts statewide, um, we're developing the demand because these folks are actually doing the work. So that leads way for them to create the demand so that we can plug these guys into these opportunities. Um, and another thing that that we've done to help um, move these efforts is incentivize the employers. You know, um, we're able to pay through the grants and supports of the grants is to pay 50 percent of their of salaries for the first six months. Right. Um, and so that's important to incentivize the employers as well. Um, and, and, and just to go back. The reason why this is so important is I've been teaching lead since 2009, right? And, and it was in the, at the time, it was more private companies doing the work in the private sector. 
Um, and that's a challenging thing when you talk about engaging, um, when you talk about doing the work. Because one, um, you have to compete with, with contractors that are not playing by the rules, right? And it's much tougher. Um, we've been fortunate with Governor Murphy um, uh, investing into this in this program to really create an opportunity to, one, um, be able to reach folks that probably wouldn't get this work done otherwise. So we're able to do this work at no cost to the customers. Um, we're able to bring these contracts into a network that has structure, right? We have lead managers, we're engaging lead managers, evaluators to actually go in and assess these homes, put these contractors to work. We have a system called the round robin, so they don't have to compete for the jobs. And, and, and um, so they can actually go in and do the work. And, and because the work is so vast, it creates workforce development opportunities. And we wouldn't be able to do that with government support. Um, like I said, it's tougher to push these initiatives in the private world. Um, so with government support, meaning um, having grants to be able to do this work at no cost to the people that we serve, also to the contractors that are doing the work, they don't have to compete by in, in, in a bidding process that would um, often um, give way to folks that are not following the rules. So the grant kind of gives us structure to be able to do this work. Um, and, and it's the government support that's really helped us uh, push these agendas. But, you know, um, clean New Jersey also have a clean energy program to not exclude low income. It has a clean energy program for folks that do not qualify for the low income. They can participate in a, a moderate and beyond income. And, and um, in order to do that, companies, they have to be certified. So we'll, we see these guys um, come to get the certification. But what that also does is creates more workforce opportunities because these contractors that are doing that work can also hire folks that um, that are willing to get into this field. And I think reason why this is so important, I, um, and, and Brian mentioned this in his introduction, is that, you know, the people that we serve is important. You know, we're providing comfort, and, and and efficiency, meaning they can save money. I, I think that's important. And when folks understand what, how important this work is, I think that helps them mo it's motivate them to, to want to be a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem. And with lead, you know, it is really destroying our babies. And, and, and it's just we just can't uh, uh, put people in, in, in subpar housing and poison them to stupidity and blame their lack of adversity on, on a lack of determination. Um, so we want to be at the forefront with providing healthy homes, energy efficiency homes, and in doing that, it's going to create a vast workforce. And we are in, in a great position to influence that work by giving folks the necessary training, removing barriers so that they can um, get a job, manage their finances, and, and be a part of the solution. And, and what I love about it is, you know, we focus on the buildings, which is important because that connects to the health of the occupants, but we're also working on the individuals. So we're building up the individuals as well. And I think that's critical. Um, and I see the evidence of that. Um, just I just got um I just got promoted to director and now I am tasked with not only uh, doing the training that I do, now I'm building a team to help me do this work. And I just recruited one of the guys from the Iowa Street team who is a returning citizen like myself. And I'm gonna develop his skills so that he can train just like I trained and I was developed. And what this does is it shows that the people that we serve that is possible for them as well. We are the evidence of what's possible. And, and I think it's just, it's like on the ground, you know, and, and um, just promoting a guy that was on the street team in the trenches, giving him an opportunity to elevate his skill set and develop him so that he can now be on the training side is just the evidence that we talk about. And I think this is what ours is all about, uh, uh, bringing people up, finding them where they are, developing them and putting them in a system that not only works for the individual, but it works for the communities that we serve. Thank you so much, Andre, and congratulations on your promotion. And um, I know it'll do uh, very good things for, for Trenton and for New Jersey. So thank you. Um, and I'm going to want to come back to you on some of those uh, soft skills that you mentioned. Sure. Um, but first, let me go over to uh, Simon Schmidt from uh, Skill Lab, uh, which is in the EU. Um, Simon, can you explain to us like what is skills lab, um, who the platform is designed for and how it helps to target groups who are looking for these kind of job opportunities and specifically how it can help uh, create opportunities in the energy efficiency sector. Great, yeah, thank you, Jane, and thanks for having me. So first off, 
Skilla, we're um, a software company based in the Netherlands. And what we do is we build software that helps people connect people with education and jobs by focusing on their skills and removing barriers like titles, degree requirements, et cetera, from uh, what keeps from what keeps people from accessing opportunities that they might otherwise access. Uh, we work in 45 countries around the world on building career guidance and labor market information systems. And since COP26, we've been very actively working with the UNFCCC and the high-level champions on sort of figuring out what the workforce dimension, the workforce challenges of the transition to a green economy look like. So specifically, we usually see sort of three different barriers. The first is quite simple. So what are what are the skills that are actually needed for the transition? So what are the skill requirements that we locally need in order to, is it more, is it more focused on retrofitting? Is it more focused on heat pump installation? So what are the local challenges that we're experiencing? And what is the local skill space that is there to address those challenges? Um, the second question is, if we know this, if we have this information, and this is an example of some work we're doing in Egypt at the moment, for example, is we have this information, we know what the skills that are, we know the skill requirements, we know the skill need to bolster the renewable sector. Um, but what does education and training look like that recognizes these skill needs while also recognizing existing skill sets and giving people the opportunity to use the skills that they already have and transition into those job roles that are necessary for the transition. Um, and then lastly, and I think this is sort of the central question, is how do we get more people interested in these jobs and these training programs? Because sitting here in, in, in Western Europe, there's a, the labor shortages and skill shortages, are, and I know the situation in Canada and the US looks quite similar, are pretty intense, right? And there, there are real shortages, not just of the right skills, but of people of people who might want to consider those skills. So we have to think about broadening the labor force, bringing more people in, bringing people into from more, bringing people from sort of non-traditional uh, backgrounds into those jobs like, um, like construction work or, or plumbing or whatever it might be, right? So you need to broaden the labor force. That means you have to give access to, to, uh, to women, to vulnerable groups, to formerly incarcerated people, what have you to get the workforce and to get the workers that you need in order to address these challenges. So removing these, first of all, broadly summing up, so identifying the skills that are needed, building the programs that, that convey those skills that are needed, and providing information about the existence of those jobs, the fact that these are good jobs and the fact that these are jobs for the future are sort of the three important pieces. And where we come in there is sort of building that ecosystem around that skill identification, uh, providing that information about skill needs to training and education providers, because we are not a training and education provider, and then providing tools around career guidance and information to a more diverse group of people, to everybody in the labor market, to everybody that may be looking for work so that they can access that information, know about these jobs, know about the requirements for these jobs, and are able to pursue these jobs. So. And that's sort of that's sort of the, the the universe that we work in, from from sort of identifying the skills that are needed to getting people into those jobs and into those training programs to fill those jobs as well. Thanks, Simon. That's really interesting to to hear about. And I think again, kind of this thinking broadly about removing barriers is is so important, especially when you talk about the workforce shortage. Something that your your remarks kind of brought up for me and made me think of what Magore said, and then also the experience I know from Andre, and I was curious about this for you, Corey, is Magore, you mentioned that one of the barriers is that training materials are often not actually like related to the needs on the ground. And from where where we are, we're, we're thinking about um, kind of training in terms of, uh, let's say, like sector, occupation, et cetera. Um, but I wanted to go back to this question of when you're actually meeting with an individual and you're saying, okay, this is the intervention and here's the training, I, I want to hear more from all of you about this question of, you know, does that help? Is it helpful to have sort of a, like, how can we think about training materials in a way that it actually meets that individual where they are. Um, because I know a lot of governments are thinking about kind of developing training programs and academic institutions, vocational schools are developing training programs. But the question really is, 
um, what, what can we do to actually make those more related to the realities on the ground so that people can actually really use them? And I think importantly, so that they don't feel this isn't for me. I don't know what this is. This doesn't relate to my life. I think it's partially this kind of communication piece also, which I would love to kind of hear from, especially um, Corey McGorry and Andre, but Simon, you as well, kind of that communication piece. How are you communicating to people, you know, what this, what the training is, what the jobs are, and then kind of what those benefits are, especially in communities where there's a lot of other kind of priorities and concerns. So I'm just going to kind of throw it open. Feel free to just jump in. Somebody unmute yourself and let's go. All right. Can I, can I address it? First, can I can I jump Please, in? Please go ahead. All right. Um. So, um. Yeah. I, I think we we learn as we go as well. We figure out, you know, in order to uh, get folks into this workforce, what are their needs are. Um. And and I think one important part of that is having the employers at the table so they can talk uh, tell us what their needs are, because even in the energy efficiency sector, there are various jobs, various trades within that sector. Um. And I talk about this with the local contractors that actually go in to do the shell work or do the lead remediation, that you need guys with carpentry skills. Yes. And, and so that development is important. So we've actually um, we've actually partnered with some um, construction guys that actually do that training because the network, the lead network has said, what are some of the challenges? Well, sometimes the guys aren't as skilled as they introduce themselves to be when they hired them and they need those skills. So we wanted to provide those skills to take care of that gap. Um, but also when you talk to the energy efficiency companies that do this work, even some of the bigger companies, there are also administrative duties that need to be done. There's uh, uh, data entry, there's marketing. So there's various things in case folks don't want to go into the attics or, or go into the basements and do that work. There's also other opportunities that are, are, are administrative. Um, but another thing that's very interesting in the energy efficiency world is that it's upward mobility. You can start off in the attic doing uh, energy efficiency measures, but if you are diligent, you can also advance to, uh, uh, to a building analyst or an auditor. So there's upward mobility. I've seen guys come in entry level and then advance to program manager. Now they are coordinating the program efforts. So there's a and that gives guys, um, uh, it excites guys to see that it's not just an industry where, you know, it's just all uh, 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 hard work, but there's also, you can also move up into management if you're diligent. Um, but to help foster that, the soft skills, meeting them where they are and, inter and, and, and introducing skills that really help them find out, you know, how to get along with supervisors, how to get along with coworkers, how do they manage their anger? How do they manage these things? Um, you often um, want to uh, bring them in and, and train them up so that, so that when they, when you introduce them to the employer, um, they, they are, they're ready. Um, but then also um, have coaching available for those employees that once they once they are on the job, we want to if they have issues, we have coaches to really help them through that. And I think that's that's an incentive to the employer, too, because, you know, it's it's expensive to uh, to have that kind of turnover, you know, uh, and when guys come in and they have to fire them. So we're saying we'll help sustain those jobs by working with those individuals and coach them up. Um, but again, you get feedback from the um from the contractors from the from the employees when you get feedback you can always make adjustments as you go to make sure that you are hitting the mark and i think you know this is not a, a thing where everything is just set and it's on paper one way no this is constantly evolving i've seen the evolution of this work over the years we're learning about we're learning from it and and i think the more we listen to the industry by invite listen to the employers, um, and then talking to other community agencies just like ours, we can kind of partner together to really have this ripple effect to really put folks that need these jobs to work. Thanks, Andre. Um, and McGorry, I see you nodding, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on you to kind of give your, your thoughts on this one. Yeah, um, I'm nodding enthusiastically because um, I think Andre is really touching on on, on the, the critical things to consider. Um, I mean, he talked about uh, trainers, uh, sort of people you've trained becoming the trainers, which is absolutely, uh, you know, relational. Um, he also talked about um, sort of this idea of, of sort of keeping, keeping plugged in to the trainees 
which also does happen with the Build Her program that I give an example of, whereby the mentorship actually continues um, while the women are on their jobs, um, therefore providing a structure and a system of support that they traditionally would not get if they had gone into the workforce in the construction industry. Um, I, I sort of also want to reflect again, um, maybe it's my own bias, back to the gender perspective. <laughs> so I, at some point I will have to correct for my bias, but um, my background is actually um, uh, as an architect and urban planner. So I have been to construction sites um, on the African continent where, for example, something as simple as um, <laughs> the construction is ongoing and there's only one bathroom um, for both men and women. Um, so they're, they're sort of very critical um, the soft issues that need to be dealt with. And, and that understanding doesn't come until um, people who are designing the spaces, designing, um, whether it's designing an actual physical space of work or designing safe training spaces, unless people who are actually uh, affected by these decisions are part of the decision makers. Um, so I think, I think it's back to the, the role of sort of the communities who will, who are supposed to benefit. And, and that's why it's really important to start from the perspective of co-creation, not to just uh, fit a, progr a program into the community. And I think um, Cor Corey was also talking about this, just the, the local networks is already work that's happening on the ground. Um, and that's the only way you can actually address the specific the specific challenges um, and, and also get sort of program buy-in right from the start. Um, so I think for me, it's 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 really co-creation of training programs, um, ensuring that the people designing the programs um, understand the issues from a first-hand perspective, if possible, um, and then listening to what the local communities need to ensure that the programs that are developed are not just touch and go, but create sort of sustainable and meaningful long-term change. Thank you, Maguri. I It's it's so spot on. And, you know, just your example of the site with just one shared bathroom. I mean, these are things and, you know, Andre's mentioning the soft skills as well that are, I think, equally important as the technical training, but much more easily sort of overlooked or thought, you know, oh, that can be figured out later when actually it's it's quite essential to the success of, of these programs. Um, Simon, I see you nodding in your hand up. So love to hear from you. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the, the point that Andre made around engaging employers and really keeping employer needs in mind. And it's sort of a, it, it's something that, that we have a lot of experience doing and serving employers and sort of what the occupational needs are, what the requirements are, what the skill requirements are for certain occupations. But we also, we also do the same with the workers who are actually performing those jobs. We see sort of significant differences in what employers expect and what workers tell us they do every day in their day to day on their job. And sort of figuring out where those requirements lie, probably somewhere in the middle between those two expectations, and shortening pathways for workers to get into those jobs by focusing on what is essential in performing well on that job. And then, again, focusing on how to make training programs accessible and attractive. It's also about recognizing the skills and the capabilities that people already have and what is transferable to new occupations. And not reinventing the wheel, not relearning skills that people already have and turning a year-long training program into a six-month training program. So that's that's about accessibility because those six months or a year, you might be out of the workforce, you might not be getting paid enough to support your family, et cetera, et cetera. So accessibility is also about ensuring that people have the shortest possible pathway into jobs and in, ensuring that employers are realistic about what expectations are and that training providers are doing a good job in, in recognizing what's already there and in recognizing recognizing that prior learning to get people onto other pathways. And something that, that your remarks just brought up for me too is this question of, you know, are people, when, when we're thinking about targeting, you know, vulnerable communities or um, more more marginalized communities in general are, are what about compensating for training is there some kind of you know because that's taking taking time out of other things people are doing whether it's caring for families or it's other informal work you know how are we kind of structurally thinking about that because again from from the perspective of kind of technical training you know you don't mention that really but actually in terms of how people are going to engage with training in their lives you know that can be like a really key component um, but let me go over to you, Corey. Um, uh, well, 
I think you do have something to add. So great. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I definitely agree with Simon Andre McGree. It's it's definitely on the point of accessibility. And and someone mentioned earlier, uh, meeting people where they are. I think that's very important, especially for for indigenous communities in Canada from our from our perspective. I mean, um we talk about where the training opportunities are. They're all like they're always often off reserve away from community. Um, so there's an accessibility issue there uh, where it's it's very it's very tough. It's almost a a culture shock uh, at sometimes for for you know community members to leave their community, have to travel. Uh, sometimes they're coming from remote communities. They don't have experience moving to city centers, things like that. Uh, so there's there's almost that culture shock, and it's it's very hard to leave home and leave their families and their culture when when that's you know what you've grown up in and what you're you're used to. I think that's been a big thing, uh, and and so there are examples of of uh, s some indigenous examples in Canada where actually they've been able to bring the training straight into communities, and uh, they've done trades training and they've done other employment opportunities right in the community, so that you know you're meeting people literally where they are, uh, so they're able to actually take these learnings while they're supported with family. And the other thing is, yeah, with the, the full um, when it comes back to like. Uh, leaving their families and things like that, that we just mentioned. I mean, it's, it's something that, you know, I, I've experienced myself uh, growing up in the community and, and, and it's hard to leave. You, you, you get, you get homesick. Right. And it's, it's very much, uh, that's been a, a big restriction. And then going back to what uh, Andre said, I mean, it's just really uh, the other um, sort of barrier that I, I guess, or maybe it, it comes back to that engagement, uh, but it's just identifying what training and employment skills are required for energy efficiency projects. Um, how do you really design and plan for that? Uh, I think that it's just that awareness and that education piece that that really needs to happen. Um, so like, where do you even begin? Uh, and, and are these jobs going to be sustainable jobs? And by doing large scale projects, you know, we're talking We've had in our first cohort had projects looking to plan 100, 200 home deep energy retrofits. So, you know, these are five, 10, 10 plus year projects where, you know, you have that sustainability in, in employment. So uh, that's the sort of uh, the, the approach that we're taking. But yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I hear a lot of uh, similar uh, you know, the, the, my whole the whole panel here is uh, bringing up similar points to to what we've experienced, and it's it's actually refreshing to to hear. And so, thank you all for sharing. Uh, if uh, if any of our panelists want to jump in right now, please do. Other oh, Andre, you're off mute. Yeah, so go ahead. Yes. Um. And and I just wanted to yeah, I, I I agree, Corey. Um. Just to hear like like minded folks doing this stuff in the communities is very refreshing and is energizing. And, and I'm really psyched up and, and I'm just going to keep going. Um, but I just also wanted to add that um, to piggyback what Simon said, um, you know, we do get folks at different levels and, you know, um, some may not need certain skills. So, you know, you want to have these pipelines to address folks at different levels. But when they are on a level that needs more attention, that's important. Um, but one thing we also learned that. It is, it is that constant, that constant mentorship that McGarry mentioned is important. And what we've learned too is, you know, um, just the job is not enough for these guys. You also have to work on your finances. So we've also developed a program to help them get financial coaching um, so that they are, you know, doing their finances right. Because what that does for the employer, if, if, a, if, if a person is working on their finances while they're working, they have financial goals, then they're more likely to maintain that job. Uh, because now they're looking at, we're looking at it holistically, not just the individual getting a job, but how do you manage your money? How do you, what, what do you do on your off time? You know, all of these things are sometimes important to, to address, uh, with these guys, with these folks so that they are maximizing these opportunities. And, and that's our holistic approach, finances, job, you know, uh, just having support groups, like in the soft skills In the soft skills, it's sort of like a support group because folks can can talk about some of the successes they had, some of the challenges they had. And you hear a lot of folks can like, man, that was interesting. I never looked at it like that. It's that stuff on the ground, really addressing those issues. It becomes like a support group 
And I know because um, I'm a returning citizen. So I knew when I came home, I made a lot of mistakes because I hadn't had those supports, you know, um, and I made mistakes that I recovered from. Um, but now I'm just happy to be a part of a system where we're creating supports that wasn't there. And I was sort of a special, a special guy, in my opinion, to really fight through that. But now that we have an opportunity to have this, get these supports in place to help people avoid some of the some of the things I had to go into and, and make mistakes at. So I think that's that's also important. Any of our panelists jumping in? Yeah, no, I couldn't I couldn't agree more with the, the importance of support, whether that is and we're talking about in talking about being more inclusive, we're talking about really cross-sectional issues from childcare to allow more women to participate in the workforce to reframing records of incarceration, reframing experiences being out of the workforce, whether it's for child rearing or for taking care of your elderly parents or whatever else it might be, reframing those experiences as valuable, not as gaps in the resume that might keep you from getting hired, right? So, the, But really providing support all around, whether it's career guidance, whether it's financial, all of this is important if you want to broaden broaden who participates and who gets to participate and who gets to access training, access education, and who gets to access in these good jobs that we're trying to build in the green transition, right? So that's, I think it's a, the, the importance of wraparound support um, is something I think that we can all agree on from all of the different countries that we're from or work in. So I very much agree with that. Thanks, Simon. And it brings up this question for me. And Maguri, one of the reasons I was curious about the scale up of the Build Her program is because, you know, it seems like you need kind of funding and support from a number of different areas because you need the kind of technical training for these jobs. You need the the dialogue or the relationship with industry so that there's there's, I mean, we keep talking about these shortages, but on the other hand, you need the employer at the table who's going to take the workers who are trained, but then you do need, whether it's the soft skills or transportation or payment uh, or, you know, some subsidization while training, you sort of need that financial piece as well. So it's a lot of kind of coordination. And I'm wondering, you know, Magori, in your experience, like, are you seeing that that's available to tap into? And as we kind of talk about, you know, global climate goals and these transitions, I mean, is this something that we should be focusing more on sort of how to bring together these different streams in a coordinated way? Thanks so much. Um, I, I think it's definitely down to sort of better collaboration and coordination between all these uh, various parties, whether it's public sector, private sector, academia, and uh, people in the construction industry um, who are working in the construction industry. Just maybe as an example, um, one of the challenges um, that does happen even in a lot of African countries is um, with regards to education, where education is not reflecting what is happening um, out there in the industry. So you have all the students who are churned out of whether it's technical training institutes, whether it's um, um, a degree certificates are churned out of different um, academic institutions into a job market that has um, that is ahead of what they're learning. Um, so I think it requires a little bit more agility with regards to um, the changing environment um, in all the various training that has to happen in, in the energy efficiency space. Uh, better collaboration, a bit of agility uh, between the different industry stakeholders, um, and then uh, really ensuring that um, all these different uh, stakeholders are speaking to each other. So there's a clear understanding, whether there's someone in training, whether it's in the industry. Um, and I think uh, across the globe, the situations are different. And actually, I think, Andrea, how do you say that it's easier to work with governments than, than the private sector um, with regards to some of the initiatives? Uh, and I would say, on my end, I think it's it's the reverse. It's easier to work with private sector than it is to work with government. Um, so, so I think it's it's really dependent on the on the specific uh, situations. Um, but but I would say sometimes it does come down to um, the money discussion, um, and and by the money discussion are programs that are benefiting local communities getting the funding that they need. 
um, is are there private sector incentives being provided to private sector to onboard some of the most um, vulnerable communities or underrepresented communities into their workforce? Um, with regards to policy, do the different governments have the funding to push policy that will support um, development of these training skills? Um, and then, of course, um, at the community level, what uh, besides, um, you know, we can always speak to healthy homes and the quality of living, but is there going to be economic transformation at that level um, for the families? Um, so, so I think that would be really my my sort of um, uh, end, ending shot, which is really, it comes down to a full a value chain. Uh, does the money make sense? Does it make sense for everybody across the board? Thanks, Magori. And that sort of brings up another question, which is evaluation and sort of how these programs are evaluated and what what is used to evaluate it. So what is the and and not everyone may agree on what the what success looks like in these programs. Um, but Corey, let me ask you sort of a similar question, which is, you know, you mentioned and I think it's a great point that people don't always want to leave home for the training or maybe for the jobs and that, you know, bringing that training to people is is something that you know is really positive so why why doesn't that happen more why you know we see that that's that's one answer is or is it happening more is this the sort of thing where um you know you're giving recommendations for funding for these sort of specific initiatives that that whether it's transportation whether it's you know bringing training to people and that you're seeing uh, that reflected in, in your funding? Um, or do you feel like it's still sort of this, like, really this kind of push to get the initiatives that are needed for, like, program uptake? I think it's really around building that understanding with employers again and, and with, with um, for, for us, I think, you know, it, it, it's easy to overlook the, the hard, like, how hard it is how for an Indigenous person to leave home uh to and and receive training right like it you know you, it seems so simple you just you go to the city you move away uh you leave your family you, you if you had it, it's financially hard it's it's um, uh culturally hard um it does need to happen and so what we've seen are some examples uh and it, it needs to happen more it, it there are a couple of examples where it has happened um and it's something that we do sort of are beginning to advocate more for is, is to actually be able to, to bring that straight home to them. I mean, it's, it's not something that we are, uh, it's something that I don't even know how to word this, but we, we are engaging with our funders and, 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 and governments to let them know, like, this is the type of work that needs to be to happen. Right. It, it's, it's definitely, uh, when you, when you look at the two, like I can think of two examples on the top of my mind that, you know, where this has taken place and the success that they've seen versus uh, how it's worked in, in the past where it's, you know, you send out one or two. And, and a lot of the time, I think, uh, I, I can't remember the st statistic, but it was more than 50% of we're, we're, we're not coming back uh, and successful in their training uh, when, when they leave the community, right? Like it's very tough. And so we've seen a lot larger percentage of, of successful employment and, and training people getting their certification, whether that's trades, uh, carpenters, things like that in community. Um, so it's, it's, it, it proves more successful when they have that support system there available to them. It is something that, um, you know, academic institutions are, we're, we're actually starting to connect with them more, um, uh, because that's primarily how it's, how, where the success has been is they, they're coming straight into communities to, to, to engage. Um, and so one, one example is uh, there was an all female uh, carpentry team, and this was in Tyndanega, uh, which is in Ontario, Canada. And they essentially, uh, you know, they got them trained and then now they're working on a, a tiny home pro uh, project that will be transitional housing for, uh, for a shelter and a safe place for women and children leaving an abusive situation. So like the, the, these are like the types of uh, projects that are very new. Uh, there's not a ma many examples, but what we're trying to do is uh, really start that conversation with academic institutions, with other communities, uh, other nations around, uh, sorry, other communities in Canada to really show them what's possible. Uh, this has been done now. Like there, this is something that we can really, you know, build off of how other communities are doing it and start, start uh, scaling this up as well. 
Um, it's yeah, I think it, it's it's very much it's sorely needed, and I think it, it, you know, we need to sort of all do our part to kind of bring that uh, bring those partnerships uh, sort of to establish them and get them you know, to where we need to be. I mean, our our people um, definitely like there's there's they want to be employed like they want to be able to give back to their community like there's a sense of pride around community homes and it's just kind of equipping them with the the tools that they need where they where they sort of you know in in a way that will like ensure their success or increase their chance for success i think is so important Thank you so much, Corey. Just really quickly, I know Mugari has to leave. So I just wanted to say thank you, Mugari, for uh, being in the discussion. Um, always really inspiring to to hear your perspective. Um, and I think this conversation will be continuing with us and you and hopefully with the panelists as well. Um, I don't know if you want to if you want to have a quick uh, a quick word on your on your way out, you know, please do. Yeah, sure. Um, I think just to say that um, it has been a really inspiring discussion. Um, I'm really grateful that 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 this group got together. I think um, all of us have spoken to things that we are uh, passionate and involved in. And um, I think the discussion has been really insightful. Um, and just sort of, um, I think the issue of inclusivity is is right at the center of everything that we're, we're trying to do, which is, and, and um, it comes down to those who are affected and uh, know the best their needs know, know their needs best so i'll i'll leave it at that thank you <laughs> thanks nice to meet you Magori, and good and best wishes to you and your and your work thank you thank you bye bye thank you bye thank you um so just let me just follow up from what you said uh Corey, and ask a question to all three of you and you know andre you and i've had many discussions about this in different ways kind of enabling policy environments let's say so um what can government do on this so government obviously can fund that's a big piece mm -hmm. of it um but there's often policies that you know do or do not um and intentionally or unintentionally kind of lead to um, you know, more inclusion. Um, and, and so I'm curious from sort of each of you, what, what your perspective on that is. And again, you know, this is government at every level there. And so please speak to the one that you want to, um, sure. but you know, where would you say, you know, government can kind of play, play the biggest role? Um, well, from our perspective, um, I think how they regulate, you know, um, we just they just passed a law that requires landlords to um, get an initial inspe inspection. And what that that's a step to really get more landlords uh, being more responsible. Um, and what that does, um, it, it, it kind of takes care of it's sort of dualistic. While that's important to um, to hold them accountable to that, but it also creates workforce opportunities as well, because now work has to get done in order to achieve that. And that's a statewide thing. Um, so that's important. I mean, like I said before, you know, uh, for me, especially in the lead world, uh, government support has been very important and very critical because I see the evolution of more folks at the table that are like-minded because of funding is going to actually engage agencies that are throughout the state, just like IOs participate. And what that does, it gives the work that we do structure because the government, the, the, the grant has accountability and that gives it structure and it makes it more manageable to where contractors, like I mentioned earlier, don't have to compete and there's structure, so there's accountability to it. And I think with that, you can move forward at, at getting stuff done. And without that, you really rely on uh, uh, contractors to do the right thing because it's the right thing. And oftentimes you need government to kind of step in to ensure that that happens, you know, um, because we know capitalists see capital and we don't want them to do it at the expense of the people they serve. So I think that government and support is important. And on the other end, it drives, you know, um, incentives for, for, the, for the moderate and beyond income. How do you incentivize them to participate? And when you put funding there as well, all of this goes back to workforce development. I think, Corey, you mentioned that without having to work, you know, you know, it often uh, it, it, you you prepare a guy to get a job and then they have to get laid off because the work is not there. So so uh, government incentives 
to really drive helps drive the industry um, to get this work done. So yeah, I think from my experience at IOS, without government support, it makes it much more difficult to push these initiatives. Thanks, Andre. Um, Corey, Simon. Um, yeah, and our we mostly most of our work is with governments. So obviously, government is important as a as a partner for us, but the most important role for governments, in our view, is as a convener, right? Because labor markets are one of those, especially the green transition or the transition to a green economy, it's in theory one of those instances where employers, job seekers, people at large, education providers, all have the same interests at heart. So any anything not working out is essentially a coordination problem between those different labor market stakeholders. So and government sort of sits in the middle of that, right? Like whether that's the ministries of education, labor, public employment services, whatever, whatever intermediary might sit there as an employment intermediary. And that power to convene is incredibly important, especially as for us as a technology provider who whose goal it is to increase the connectivity and communication between these different stakeholders so that uh, job seekers, people, employment services, employers, and education providers can align around or can coalesce around making sure that the skills that employers demand are supported by education providers and accessed by people. So that's that's sort of the piece where, where government has to, in our view, come in. And if government isn't there, it has to be another entity, but that other entity has a big lift if it's not going to be the government. So in our case, it's mostly the government, and but I know that's not necessarily always the same throughout different countries in the world, whether there is government intervention or intermediation in employment and labor markets and workforce development. Yeah, Simon, I, I really agree with that. And I think, you know, your comment right there actually illustrates, um, or maybe Andre's point illustrates that point completely, because, you know, in Andre's telling, it's this uh, demand, you know, government policy was driving demand for workers and then government was also supporting kind of programs and training for those workers knowing that they were driving demand through their policies but it's like you need to have that level of coordination um in order to kind of see you know see that cycle completed in that way um corey curious about your thoughts on this yeah, definitely. I think uh, the role of government you meant you mentioned it uh, was I mean obviously they they can fund but I think it's really the the funding and, and financing is a big piece to enabling these projects um, projects that we're looking to to develop that will actually create the employment opportunities that that we're working towards to you know uh, get people trained and get people uh, working in community like it, it's not going to happen if the the, the projects don't happen right like we we have seen like uh, we've done a report at Indigenous Clean Energy called Energy Foundations that really focused on the different outcomes and benefits of, of investment into en energy efficiency work in Canada. And I mean, we found that, you know, for every $1 million of investment, I think it was eight and a half, 8.8 .8 full-time equivalent jobs would be created by investing in uh, indigenous clean energy uh, energy efficiency in Canada so I mean it there's there's a huge opportunity there but it's you know without this work being uh without the funding support from government and it's not these projects won't happen fully on government funding that's I don't think that's that's feasible but uh, bringing that sort of the governments to the table to sort of engage in a um, collaborative process to to figure out a policies that will enable new pathways to fund and finance energy efficiency uh, so that we're seeing that that return on on the work uh, financially uh, and and so socially in, in the communities I think it's it's very important that you know they're they're coming to the table and and willing to 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 listen to or, or hear from from communities and from uh, from other organizations who have had that input to who can make that um, make policy inputs fr directly from uh, the grassroots level. I think, uh, yeah, I think that's really the main thing for us because, you know, the when it comes to uh, the uptake of efficiency, 
the upfront costs costs are the biggest barrier that communities face. I mean, uh, many in many cases, it's a decision decision of doing energy efficiency upgrades versus you know your living costs. Uh, I mean, people need to eat, so it's really uh, in indigenous communities in, in Canada. That's that's where we're seeing some of the. Uh, like the, the the major barrier, and so the more that government can can come in to support and incentivize, uh, you know, that's going to help us so much. Um, in terms of training, um, I think you know uh, support for there are other organizations, but Indigenous Clean Energy is like they've you know we're we're trying to do our part in terms of preparing communities uh preparing the people to actually you know step into these into this sector uh and it's now i think more up to the other side to kind of support uh from the employer side um but yeah i, I don't know i think hopefully that answers your, your question and uh, thank you again thanks Corey. um the really interesting discussion today um and I, we're, we're almost at the end of our time. So I'll ask, um, I'll ask if anybody has any kind of final, final notes that they want to put out there. Um, if you do now is your moment, feel free. So Simon, Andre, Corey, anything you want to add before we close out? Um, I, I will just say this, um, in addition to what we're talking about, and I think this is going back to on the ground. Um, now we talk about engaging the people, and 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 all of the work and then having the government support now we also have to think about how we develop our staff to be able to do this work you know um i know from my experience and having good case managers that understand the assignment to really work through some of their issues is important building your capacity to do this work because when you take on these folks that are that are coming out of the system who've been unemployed they come they you know they're marginalized communities they come with some baggage that needs to be unpacked and dealt with so you need people that understand that assignment and and really under and really have the heart to do this work and connect with organizations that provide housing and other things they have to do their due diligence so you know how you develop your staff is just as critical in how we help the people that we serve yeah, Andre, I think you're really, you're really, I think, bringing home this point of just the the real sort of interconnectedness um, between all these different pieces. And it's necessary to focus on all of them in order to really support, um, support these workers. Um, Simon, any, any last thoughts from you? And then Corey, I'll go to you. Yeah, I just, for me, I don't know how I experience, this is sort of a working in, in workforce development, working around skills and labor markets. This is a unique opportunity where we for once, have an idea of what's coming because it is like as as you mentioned, as Andre you mentioned and Jane you mentioned, some of these developments are policy driven, right? So we know what jobs we're creating. Not taking the opportunity to to adequately prepare people for these jobs because of coordination issues. It's a, it's a foregone opportunity, right? Like it's a, it's an opportunity lost. So thinking really thinking about this politically driven process that is putting some people out of work, but on the other end, creating endless opportunity for people. Not not thinking about how to equitably distribute that opportunity and how to prepare people for that opportunity would be would be a shame. So really for us, thinking about training early, thinking about skills early, thinking about workforce early, you know, it's, an, it's an often forgotten topic, but it's going to be central to make sure that A, this happens, the, the transition happens and B, it happens in a way that is equitable and leaves people better off. Thank you, Simon. And Corey, over to you. No, I fully, fully agree with, with Simon on that, um, on that point. I think it's, uh, that has to be a priority uh, when we're talking about policy and, and, and governments. I think the, the training it has, like, it needs to, uh, it needs to be, at the community level, like for the community by community, I think that's the the major thing. Uh, it's, for so long, it's been uh, external contractors and out, uh, outside community coming in to to do this work. Uh, corners are cut. Uh, the capacity is not passed on. I think we really need to to bring that to the ground level. 
uh, so that they can have that self-determination and uh, energy sovereignty uh, is a huge thing as well. So I think, yeah, I, I fully agree with my my fellow panelists here on, on the points that they're making. And uh, yeah, I think it's, I don't really have much else to say on it. I know uh, when we talk about capacity, communities and what community staff are, you know, they're overworked, uh, they're at full capacity and their main priorities just go to running their day-to-day -day operations. Uh, just to keep housing running so they can't even think about efficiency so we need to be able to, to better support communities to to uh to enable them to to grow into uh where they want to be i think that's that's how i would close this out but i, I really do appreciate everyone's time and for having me here today Thanks, Corey. Um, well, let me just say on behalf of the IA and the IA team that's here, just really grateful to all of you and uh, Mugari and Abstentia um, for offering your time and, and your experience and your insights on, on this issue. Um, I know we had a lot of people watching today and there'll be a lot of people um, watching the recording later. So just wanted to say we really want to keep this open dialogue with folks out there and with our panelists as well. Um, I think just there's going to be a lot of reaction to this just because there's so much good content. Um, so to those of you watching, you know, please feel free to um, contact us with ideas, contact, contact our panelists. Um, if, you know, you hear something that you want to learn more about, um, a lot of peer learning is really, really important. Um, and just, you know, thank you again to our, to our panelists for this really uh, very interesting and important discussion. So with that, I will say thank you and goodbye. <laughs>